Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Zipora Mwangi and I'm excited to have you on board. On this channel, we have conversations about lifestyle, education and kingdom living. And our theme verse is Proverbs 23, verse 23 that talks about buy truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom, knowledge and instruction. We are here to gather in as many principles from the word of God as possible so that our tagline here is that we can do life well and do it god's way and on today's conversation we want to continue with the series that we've had on the armor of god and today we want to look at the sword of the spirit and we want to see you know just get more details about this so that then we are well equipped in putting on this armor so without further ado let's get right into it so as i had stated earlier our conversation today is on the sword of the word or the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and we want to go back to ephesians chapter 6 verse 7 i'm reading the nlt version it says put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit which is the word of god so today we want to dig in into the sword of the spirit which is the word of god because we can clearly see Last time we looked at the belt of truth and we say that this is a defensive, you know, uh, part of the armor of God. Today we are looking at the offensive part of the word of the Lord, which is the sword of the spirit. And now you and I know very clearly that we don't pick up a sword when we are, when, when it's time to play. We pick up a sword because we are in trouble, we need to defend ourselves, yeah? And so we need to use a great weapon. And and so therefore, the word of God clearly tells us here that the sword of the spirit, yeah? Meaning that then uh, it is in the spiritual realm, it appears as a sword. We may look at it in the physical and not see those aspects of it that make it a sword, but in the spiritual realm, I would like you to know that it is a sword. Because the Bible says so, and by the way, even I uh, have had personal experiences when the word of God, when God spoke to me in dreams and and the, the word looked like a sword. And so therefore, for me, this is something I've actually experienced. So I want us to look at another scripture that talks a little bit more about the sword or the word of God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So now this scripture is a very good scripture because it now expounds for us a little bit further about this word of the spirit, which is the word of God. It says it is alive. We all know it is alive because last week we looked at John chapter 1 verse 1 that talks about uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God you know and that the word came into this world and became flesh and so we saw also that Jesus um, uh, referred to himself as the truth as the word of God and so knowing that Jesus is the word of God we know that then Jesus died and rose again and he's seated in the in uh, uh he's seated in heaven on the right hand of, uh, side of the lord and so when the word says that the word of god is alive we know for sure it is alive and then when we the bible says that it is not only alive it is also powerful we very well know it it is powerful because we clearly saw the works the signs and the wonders that jesus performed while he was here on earth Clearly, we also saw that the, the word of God, that all scripture in the Bible is breathed by the Holy Spirit, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is there for sharpening, for equipping, for training, for rebuking, you know. It's there to help us, even as believers, to walk life well, to do life well. And so, therefore, when the Bible says it is powerful, we know it's powerful because the spirit that was in, in at work in operation in the life of Jesus while he was while he was here, that is the spirit of the living God that is in us who are believers. 
very well know also that it is a spirit that brought back Jesus from the dead. And Jesus is alive. So therefore, we know that Jesus died and rose again. So therefore, we can say, when the word of God says it's alive, for sure Jesus is alive, it is powerful. Yes, it is able to raise people from the dead. It is able to heal diseases. It is able to cast out demons. It is able to do so much more, even in our lives, when we allow the word of God to continue uh, being at work. Another thing is that we can see it is sharper. It's actually... You can see the, the, the way they use the symbol, the symbol of the sword, that the word of God is sharper than a sword. Now, you and I know very clearly that the sword is sharp. And we can see that the sword is very different from a knife because with a knife, it has only one side that cuts. But with a sword, it has two sides that cut, meaning it cuts as it goes in and it cuts as it goes out. And it's able to tell apart. It's able to help you and I tell apart. It tell it exposes thoughts. It also exposes desires. Now, this is extremely important for us because we are going to look at Jesus as a perfect example on how to use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How should we then use it as an offensive weapon? And I like the fact that Jesus gave us a template, which you and I have read and have listened to in various sermons over and over. But I beseech you to just stay with me and let's see what are those other things that we could learn today from the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and how best to use this particular part of the armor. Now, we are going to read the book of Luke chapter 4, and I'm reading the Amplified Version I will read the whole text all the way up to verse 13 and then we are going to go deep into it uh, just based on what the uh, what Satan was saying, what Jesus was saying and the, the, the things that we can learn from this particular scripture. This is what the Bible says. Now Jesus full of the Holy Spirit returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil and he ate nothing during those days. And when they ended, he was hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the son of God, command this stone to turn into bread. Jesus replied to him, It is written, and forever remains written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Then he led Jesus up to a high mountain and displayed before him all the kingdoms of the inhabited earth and their magnificence in the twinkling of an eye. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this realm. And its glory, its power, because it has been handed over to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it will all be yours. Jesus replied to him, it is written and forever remains written. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then he led Jesus to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said mockingly to him, if you are the son of God. Throw yourself down from here, for it is written and forever remains written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard and protect you. And they will lift you up and on their hands so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus replied to him, It is said in scripture, You shall not tempt the Lord your God to prove himself to you. When the devil had finished every temptation, he temporarily left him until a more opportune time. Now, I want us to go through this scripture slowly because I think there are so many, many nuggets for us to take away today, especially when we think about the armor of God and we consider the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the first thing we see is that we can see the context. So Jesus has just been baptized at River Jordan. The spirit of the living God uh, testified of who he is. And then the spirit led him into the wilderness. Now, I want to point out something here. Sometimes we get into the wilderness, but we are the ones who took ourselves there. And let me tell you, you're going to struggle. Because unless the Holy Spirit is with you while you are in the wilderness, the wilderness is not an easy place to be. It is a difficult place. And if we look at the lives of the Israelites, we can see that when they left Egypt, which you can be sure was also a very hot place, well, it was very much, the temperatures were very, uh, very high. 
and life was difficult and there was a lot of oppression. But when they went into the wilderness, I tell you, the wilderness will bring forth the things that are hidden in your heart. So the wilderness moments are actually really good for all of us, yeah? But we need to be led there by the Holy Spirit. Just as we can see, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And we can see the Bible also tells us how long. It talks about for 40 days, he was tempted by the devil. So, you know, sometimes when you read about these temptations, we, in a great way, it almost sounds like this all happened in a day or in a very short time, you know, in a few, because of the way the text is written. But these 40 days were really times of great trials, great temptation. And so we can see that he ate nothing day. He didn't eat anything at night. And when he was, when the 40 days were over, you can be sure he was hungry. Okay. And we can see the very first thing that happens to him is that the devil appears to him and tells him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to turn into bread. Now, let's first look at the very first thing that the Satan says. If you are the son of God, what was he saying? You know, the devil loves to play with our mind. He loves to put in doubt. This statement, what if, is a statement that states doubt. It presents the fact that you do not believe. It questions the authority of God, the sonship of who Jesus is. So the Satan one was approaching him when he was hungry and he was telling him, by the way, if you truly are the son of the living God, you know, he was questioning the character of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but there are many times in this world people will question who we are. They question our ability to do certain things. And I'm going to be honest with you, especially in the marketplace, when we think about the places that we work. If you are a woman that is working in an industry that is male dominated, there will always be that question. Can you really perform? Are you really able to do this? Are you really? And sometimes even from one community to another, we sometimes look at other people and assume they have no capacity. They are unable to do perform certain tasks. And that is the first thing that the enemy was trying to do. He was questioning the character of God. But, and then the second thing is he addressed the need. What need did Jesus have? He needed to eat. And what did he need to eat? He needed to eat bread. Now, let me tell you something. Now, if you come from the African society, you might not understand the value of bread because for us in Africa, we have a tendency to eat. We have so many things that we take and bread is considered, I mean, a snack. It's something that you take for breakfast. It's not really a meal. It's, uh, it's not something that we highly value. So sometimes we, have an, uh, we misunderstand this scripture because we lack understanding on what the role of bread is. And so when Jesus was being asked about commanding stones to turn into bread, the very first thing we see is that the enemy was addressing his need. And now this is something that I want to remind you because the book of James chapter 1 verse 14 says, I read the amplified version, but every person is tempted when he is drawn away, enticed and baited, by his own evil desires, that is lust and passions. Let me tell you, the things that you are tempted with are in line with your desires. And we can clearly see here, Jesus had an excellent desire, by the way. He was hungry, he needed to eat. So bread was a, definitely a very good option. So, and the very first thing that I want us to note is that one of the places that the enemy will always catch us is at the place of food shelter and clothing basic needs and you know the book of matthew chapter 6 if you are to read that text and especially verse 33 reminds us but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well what things was jesus talking about the things that he had earlier spoken about which were he had spoken about the sparrows you know the birds of the air that they never saw but the the, the lord jesus that the lord continues to provide for them. He talks about the lilies of the valley, that they were better clothed than Solomon who had the finest clothing on this planet. And yet the Bible says that 
God has clothed the lilies of the valley better than King Solomon's garments. Yeah, he was also talking about drink. People are worried about what they will eat. People are worried about what they will drink. So Jesus was addressing the issue of our basic needs, that our food, shelter, and clothing, which are very basic for us, is the one place you need to guard. Because let me tell you the truth, many are drawn away at the very first stage of temptation, which are the first stage of temptation is on your basic needs, food, shelter, and clothing. If the enemy can catch you there, he doesn't need to go far. And so therefore with Jesus, that's where the enemy always starts. And that's why we have a template here of the temptations that took place in the life of Jesus. Now, the very second, and we can see Jesus responded in verse 4. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. What do we see about that text? We see that Jesus did not bother to address the question about his character. He didn't have to prove anything to him. And this is the thing you and I need to get to a place. I know many of us, when it comes to proving ourselves, the first thing we do is that we get very irritated by people. We get offended by people who feel that we cannot do something or, you know, we are incapable. And that thing irritates you and causes you to behave or even to speak out of anger. And let me tell you, that is one thing that the Lord wants us to check. Always check. You need to be careful about this thing of trying to prove yourself to the world. Yeah? You need to leave it to the Lord to be to avenge for you in instances where you need vengeance, yeah? But you also must look into what is the enemy really trying to say. The enemy was talking to him about bread. He was addressing a need. And Jesus, Jesus addressed that need because that was the issue there. You know, that was a really big deal. And Jesus was clear. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, I want to present to you this text because i mean it's interesting i tell you the devil has such audacity the book of john chapter 6 and i'll just read a few verses verse 30 to to 35 it says i read the niv version so they asked him what sign then will you give that we may see and believe you what will you do our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness as it is written he gave them bread from heaven to eat Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and give, gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So we can see Jesus is actually the bread of life. You can imagine the audacity that the enemy had to approach the bread of life and to tell him to look at a stone and cause it to become bread. And let me tell you the truth. Satan has the audacity to tell you some stuff that will irritate you. And sometimes he will use people to get you to that place of irritation so that you lose your cool and you forget to use the sword of the word of God. Remember, yours is not to raise accusations. Now, notice how the Lord Jesus responds. The Lord Jesus never accused Satan at any point. Jesus spoke the word of God because the word of God is enough. So you cannot join the camp of the enemy to fight the enemy. Mm -mm, it doesn't work that way. You don't use the tactics of Satan against Satan. No, you use the strategy given by God against Satan, which is a strategy against the enemy, the word of God as it is. It is enough. You don't need to add any fluff to it. All right. So let's move on to the next section. Now, we can see that verse 5, the, Satan takes Jesus to a high mountain and displays to him the kingdoms of the earth. Now, I would like you to go back to our, one of the videos that we, we looked at and we were addressing the issues of the kingdoms. We said there are only two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Under the kingdom of darkness, we have many kingdoms. And we can see here what the enemy was displaying are the kingdoms of the earth. There are many. There are very many kingdoms of the earth, but they are under the rulership of Satan. And now we can see he was just showing him power and glory, magnificence in, the, in a very short, 
you know, instance. So after the enemy has addressed the food, shelter, and clothing, he goes to the next thing, which is success. Let me tell you, because this is the one thing that has led many people astray. You know, when we think of success, many of us look at success from the standard of the world. What is the standard of the world? The standard of the world is power. The standard of the world is the glory and splendor and the magnificence. That is the standard of the world. It is in amassing things, property, you know, amassing to ourselves, having a name, having a great following, having people, you know, having a, you know, a magnificence, glory and power to be renowned, you know, to be very popular with people. That is what Satan offers. But I want us to take note of a number of things here. Uh, the response that Jesus makes. So actually verse 7 says, therefore, if you worship before me. So he first shows him what he could give him, which is exactly what the enemy will always do to us. Shows you what he can give you. And then verse 7, he tells you, if you worship before me, all this will be yours. And verse 8 says, "For it, the, the Lord responded, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now let me tell you something. Jesus did not address the issue of the kingdoms of the world. He did not address that. What did Jesus address? He addressed the issue of worship. And let me tell you the truth. Because the enemy will always come to us. Because we are in the pursuit of success in this life. Every one of us wants to be successful. But I tell you, and I challenge you, you had better have the right version of what success means. Success in the kingdom of God looks like what? Success in the kingdom of God is your ability to walk in line with the purpose of the Lord. To work and do that which the Lord called you. And that on the last day, Jesus will tell you, welcome good and faithful servant. Yeah? You have been faithful in little. Now you will be given much. That is what success is. Our success is defined by God. If you are a believer, success is defined by God. So we need to be careful about the issue of success because that is the thing that the enemy is going to target. And let me tell you, the most successful individuals in this world, and I, I want to challenge you to take this to the bank. Cash it if you may. The thing is, success is directly proportional to your level of worship. You must be worshipping someone. And that person that you worship is the person that gives you success. So for you and I who are believers, our success comes from God. Our ability to do well, to work in line with the, you know, the giftings and the talents that God has given us and cause us to be faithful servants because Jesus said if you want to be the greatest in this kingdom, you must first start by becoming a servant. So we can see that the order of God in terms of success is very different from how the world looks at success. So be careful in pursuing glory and magnificence and a name and popularity and amassing for yourself wealth and things and people and I don't know all manner of stuff that we amass in this world. Be careful. Lest it takes you away because there is a price for you to pay. The price you pay for success is worship. Whether you like it or not, you're going to worship someone. So Jesus was very clear. He knows very well. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Because any other worship is idolatry. It does not matter what you may. So we are either worshiping God or we are worshiping Satan. There are, there are no gray areas. Matter salvation matters spirituality there are only two kingdoms and you're only you're either worshiping god or you're worshiping satan now we move on to that next section and uh, we see now that the that satan takes jesus to jerusalem to the highest point and then tells him he goes back now i want us to look at the strategies that the enemy is using because by the way this is a template it is an excellent example of how you and I must know the word. Now, if Jesus was not the word and the word was not hidden in him, you can see how easily it is to get, you know, misled. Now, 
The enemy says, if you, again, now he goes back to the first strategy of questioning the character of God, questioning his sonship, questioning his lordship, questioning his authority, if you are the son of God. And then what does he tell him? Throw yourself down from here. Now, what was he telling him to do? He was telling him to analyze himself. As so we may speak, which is the term that we use in these days, that you know what? Take your life. You know, how about you do this? Just, I mean, jump off. And why was he? And he actually added scripture on Twitter and said, for it is written that he will command his angels concerning you to guard and to protect you so that they will lift you up on their hands so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Now, this is the other thing I need you to know. That even when the enemy speaks to you the word of God, you must be careful because let me tell you, the truth comes from the Lord only. Satan does not speak the truth. Now, I want you to understand this, that if you read these particular verses because they come from the book of Psalm chapter 91. Now, Psalm 91 starts off very clearly. And the issue is about he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It is talking about dwelling in the Lord hiding in the Lord. It does not talk about exposing yourself to trouble, taking yourself to the lion's den so that then you can find that the Lord will, you know, will take care of you. And many other times we actually do this. We go to the lion's den, open the pen and get into the lion's den and hang out with the lion, assuming that the enemy shall not strike, you know. And so, that the enemy here was taking the message out of context, as we always do. So you and I must be careful to know the word. Jesus answered appropriately. As we can clearly see in verse 12, it says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not try to prove yourself. That is what Jesus was saying. And let me tell you, Jesus never addressed the, the question of his sonship or his authority. You and I need to know who we are. This thing for where we are trying to prove to people, to things, that we are somebody, that we are of value, that we are of worth, by doing all manner of random stuff, by trying to amass, by trying to get success, the worldly way, let me tell you, it will only end in trouble. Because as you can clearly see here, the enemy is taking the word out of context and using it against the Lord to take him to a place of temptation. And we can see Jesus was able to discern. And that's why we say that the sword of the, the word of God is sharper than the double-edged sword. It is, able, it is a designer of our thoughts and intentions. Jesus was able to discern the heart of Satan. What was he trying to do? We can see that in the very first one, he questioned his character, but also targeted his desires. The second time, when the enemy is tempting Jesus, again, he is talking to him about showing him glory and splendor. But what was the target? Worship. And we can see, so it is about discernment. Eh? And the word of God shall grant you discernment. If you continue to read the word of God, spending time in scripture, hiding yourself, in the secret place of the Most High, spending time in the presence of the Lord as you allow the Holy Spirit to teach and instruct you, let me tell you the truth. It will help you discern so that then you will be able to tell apart because that's what discernment is about, telling apart the right and the wrong. You will tell what is the underlying message behind this temptation. This temptation is attacking worship. Then you will know that the enemy is trying to drive you towards idolatry. So, and then thirdly, we can see that when the enemy was tempting the Lord, what was he talking about here? You know, he was looking at, at Jesus and he was just thinking, how about we take out Jesus before he does anything? Can you imagine that? And this is what we, I call, you know, Jesus to abort his destiny. And this is the, the last thing that I will, you know, that I want to address the issue of our destiny, the issue of purpose. If there's something the enemy is working very hard to do is that you do not fulfill 
your destiny. So he starts off at the very beginning by looking at your food, shelter, and clothing, your basic needs. Once he is done with that area and he sees that you've been able to conquer, he goes over into the issue of your success in terms of your ability to do well in this life. He knows if he can attack your area of worship, he's attacked your success, you know. And once he's done with that area, he goes to the third stage. And the third stage, he's looking at purpose. What were you created to do on this earth? He attacks that. He goes full blast by questioning your character, by questioning your authority, by questioning your sonship, by questioning who you are, the giftings that the Lord has given you. He causes you to, str to struggle, to suffer, to struggle with a self-identity crisis, to struggle with your inability to, 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 to believe that you are called for this thing. So you have this imposter syndrome concerning the things that God has called you to do, please note that is an attack on your destiny. It's an attack on purpose, on that which the Lord called you to do, on your calling. And your calling is important because your calling is beyond you. Your calling is to fulfill that which the Lord has set you out for you to do. And he gives us gifts so that then we are able to accomplish the purpose for which he created us for. So can you see? That the enemy will always want to take us out before time. The enemy will always want to take you out before time. He wanted that Jesus, instead of dying on the cross, that Jesus would die on this day of temptation. Can you imagine? I wonder how many of us have gotten to even the third stage. You know, as we are walking with the Lord. And that's why we need to put on this sword of the word of God. Remember, when we spoke about last week about the belt of truth, we said that a part of the belt had the sheath or the place where we put the sword of the word of God. Now, let me tell you, we know that the word of God is very important because we have two parts of the armor of God that are saying the same thing, the word of God. The belt of truth, which is the word of God, the sword of the spirit, it is still the word of God. And of course, they all point to who, who Jesus is. Jesus is the word. Let me tell you, you and I had better spend our time hiding in the secret place of the Most High under the shelter of Almighty because you can be sure protection is found in the Lord. And again, if you and I seek ye first the kingdom of the Lord and his righteousness, food, shelter, and clothing shall be added unto us. We have got nothing to worry about. And if you and I spend time in worshiping the Lord, you can be sure you and I are going to be successful in this life. And lastly, it's for you to know you and I have a high calling. We are a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation. And the Lord wants to make use of us. We are a chosen people. He wants to fulfill certain things through you and I. He sent you in that marketplace, that place where he, that he sent you, is so that you may harvest for the kingdom, is that you may be an excellent witness. You would be that accountant. You know if Jesus were an accountant, you should be exactly that. You should exemplify how Jesus would have behaved as an accountant. If you're a teacher, you should exemplify how Jesus would be as a teacher in the kindergarten. You should exemplify how Jesus would be wherever he sent you out. And that's why you and I cannot do this on our own. He left us with a helper, the Holy Spirit, that teaches us all truth and puts to remembrance the things that we've been hiding where? In our hearts hide the word of god you will need it and sometimes you need it daily some because you never know when this temptation will come and you see verse 13 of this particular scripture talks about when the devil had finished every temptation he temporarily left him until an opportune time so let me tell you you have to be on guard that's why your your sword needs to be readily available that you can take it out as soon as you need it and you can use it well. Because remember, if a tool is not used well, it can cause harm, can cause damage. So the truth of the word of God will help us to design deception so that we are also not misled. We are not misquoting scripture. We are not misunderstanding. We have the right revelation of scripture so that we use the word in the way that the Lord wants us to use it. So ladies and gentlemen, have yourself a lovely, lovely weekend and week ahead and let's meet next week 
as we get to see the last part of the armor of God, which is the helmet of salvation. Bye-bye.